getting some shout outs. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Vivacity Monthly Compliance Live Webinar. So in today's session, we will be covering uh, the uh, certification and completion USI, and also looking at deferring, suspending, and canceling uh, for the CRICOF standards. We'll just wait a little bit longer and then we can commence. Welcome everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> So in these sessions with the compliance webinars, uh, it's very interactive. So you can ask questions in the chat and I'll answer those questions uh, as we go. So we'll go through uh, the legislative requirements and also what we see as non-compliances that happen uh, at audit and what you need to be aware of with your certification. We've just got a couple more people jumping in. Oh, so no one could see my screen, could they? <laughs> Welcome everybody to the monthly compliance live webinar. In today's sessions, where we're going to be going through completion, and we're also going to be looking at USI, and with the CRICOS standards, we're going to be looking at deferring, suspension, and cancellation. So we're having a look at a few different uh, standards. We're also going to be looking at the format of your certificates and what you need to have in place for the format of your certificates. I've uploaded some documents that you can access here. Uh, that is fact sheets about uh, your certificates and also how to use the NRT logo. So I've got that in there as well. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Krista, Vanessa, I've got Hilton said hello as well. Hi, thank you for reaching out. Okay, so let's get this webinar started. Okay, so the standards we're going through is standard 3.1, 3.4, uh, and USI is 3.6, and with CRICOS it's 9.1 to 9.6. As per usual, this webinar forms part of the continuous improvement process under standard 2.2. Following this webinar, you should review the policies and procedures that relate to these standards and update those policies and procedures if required, or it may be that you need to realign your practices in line with the policies and procedures. Um, as per the policies and procedures for continuous improvement, you should table this at your next Q&C meeting, so your quality and compliance meeting, where you table that you attended the training, but also, what did you learn? Is there anything that you need to change or update within your practices? You should also review any documentation relating to the standards that we're reviewing in this session. So for today's session, you're going to be having a look at your certificate templates. So if you happen to have some certificates on hand, um, I would recommend that you get them out right now and have a look at them. It might be even on your computer uh, that you may be able to access them so that we can make sure that your certificates are complying with the requirements of the legislation. Please remember that no question is a silly question. You are encouraged highly to pop questions in the chat and I will endeavor to answer all of your questions. The more we get, I get engaged with you guys, the more interesting the webinar is, um, and in particular answering those questions. The reason why we have these monthly webinars live is so that we can answer your questions. So thank you very much for attending today's live session. And for those who are watching the recording, you'll be able to access all the documents that I'm referring to, either on Unicorn or on the training online. Okay, so what does the clauses 3.1 to 3.4 mean to your RTO? You're responsible for only issuing certificates to students who have been deemed competent. And you need to have collected sufficient evidence to demonstrate that those students are competent in the units that you complete, they've completed. 
So you need to make sure that you've got a sufficient database for retaining all of these records. For example, their name, phone number, address, what qualification did they do or training product? What were the units? How were they assessed? Was it uh, competent, uh, not yet competent, or was it credit transfer or an RPL? So you should be recording that within the database. It's also a requirement that you must have access uh, to the data on your database for a minimum of 30 years. Now, I believe this is going to change with the new standards that are coming through. Uh, so there will be some areas that will change with these standards, with the new standards. And I'll highlight those as I go through. So to reduce the risk, you should have a system in place to ensure the security of your certificates. And we're going to be having a look at different ranges of what you could have in place for security on your certificates. Now, if you use an Accelerate database, there is an option on there to do QR codes. So you could have QR codes on your certificate. That is the best security. So if you um, are using Accelerate and haven't switched on the QR code, I highly recommend that you do. Uh, because what happens is if anybody is uh, reviewing that certificate, they can go to the QR code and they can verify the certificate directly into your database. There are some other student management systems that do the same thing, but you need to check with your provider on what uh, and how you access that on your database. Uh, but that is the most secure is using a QR code. Uh, if you deliver from multiple locations or use third party arrangements, uh, you really need to have a look at how you're issuing your certificates uh, and we'll be going through a bit more about third parties later. Okay, so when you're issuing your certificates, you need to make sure that you're issuing the certificates within 30 calendar days of the student being assessed. So that's the requirements of the standards. When you issue the certificate, the documentation needs to go directly to the student, not to another party such as an employer. And we often see that where um, certificates are given to the employer, but not to the student. Now you can do both. You can send it to the student as well as give it to the employer, in particular if the employer has paid for it, but the student should always have access to their certificates as well. Um, Andrew has stated that he uses Accelerate. So have you got the QR code turned on on your certificates, Andrew? Love to know. I've been to a few uh, RTOs where they haven't uh, turned on the QR code. So if you, um, if you have, when you print the certificates, the QR code will come up on it, definitely. Um, and it's the most secure. So out of all of the types of certificates you can have, uh, that is the most secure. So there are different ways that you can um, ensure that your certificates are secure. And that's from um, copying the certificate. So you can use things like watermarks, or you can have a stamp, um, you can have a rubber stamp, you can have a foil. There could be different things that you put on your certificates to verify that it is the original copy. Uh, but the QR code is awesome and it's really good for issuing certificates online. So it's actually basically the only way you can issue certificates online is through having a QR code on it because it can be verified uh, really easily through the QR code. You need to, you're required to issue certificates who have completed, uh, students who have completed all units of the uh, qualification or the training product or a statement of attainment for if they happen to drop out uh, for the units that they have completed. Um, ensure that a student has records, uh, access records of certification issued to them. Uh, one of the things I like about the Accelerate database is the student actually has access. They have a login as well, and they can see how they're progressing and they're able to have a look at the units that they've completed as well. So it is a great system for being able to do that. Remedial action. Now I bring this up because one of the biggest uh, issues with when you issue a certificate and the student hasn't actually uh, provided sufficient evidence to demonstrate that they are competent within the unit. When this happens, it can put a, a big risk on your RTO. For example, there was a RTO a couple of years ago in the security industry who had issued a whole heap of certificates. I think it was about 3000 certificates. 
uh, where ASQA came in, identified that they weren't collecting sufficient evidence on their assessment tools. They issued the certificates and all 3,000 of those certificates were cancelled by ASWA be, because there was insufficient evidence collected. So you need, so this is where it's really important to make sure you're validating your assessment tools to ensure that you are collecting sufficient evidence. But the other side is making sure that you're educating your trainers and assessors on what is competent and what is not yet competent. If you haven't, as an RTO, if you haven't collected sufficient evidence, it doesn't matter what the trainer does, you're ultimately responsible. So you need to make sure that your trainers and assessors are collecting sufficient evidence to demonstrate that they are competent within the unit uh, because it can come back on you. And it's not just an ASPO issue that it could be as a concern. It could also be a concern if there was an incident that was would have may occur in the workplace that from that student who may not have been um, sufficiently assessed as competent within the unit of competency. And the insurance firms are gonna go for you if the student wasn't trained properly and assessed properly. So it's a big risk and you need to make sure that your trainers understand the importance of uh, when they're issuing a competent or not yet competent, that that has a direct impact on the RTO and that you need to ensure that you're collecting sufficient evidence as well. And I know we've got a, number of trainers online today. Uh, so that's where I want to emphasize that with the trainers is making sure that you are collecting sufficient evidence to demonstrate that the student is competent. Now, sufficient evidence is sufficient evidence against the performance criteria and the assessment conditions within the training product. So it's making sure that you've addressed all of that, that we cover in assessment validation. So a different uh, area. Uh, so if you wanna know more about that, you need to have a look at our webinars on standard 1.8, where you'll be able to get more information about validation. We also have a whole validation course that you can access as well. Okay, standard 3.4. So records of learner AQS certification documentation are maintained by the RTO in accordance with schedule five and are accessible to current and past learners. So what that means is uh, you don't have to actually have a database that they need to have access to, uh, like I mentioned with Accelerate, but they should be able to ring you and get a certificate reissue at any given time because you should have all of the data in place within your database. So that's where data integrity is really, really important and making sure that you've got all of that information in there. And when you go to verify a student's record, you actually have sufficient evidence within the database to be able to verify uh, that they are that person uh, if you're doing a certificate reissue. So you are required to maintain a certificate register and that normally is through a student management system or an, also known as an EVETMIS compliant database. So EVETMIS compliance is that you are entering all of the details on the EVETMIS data, for example, name, date of birth, uh, year, born, uh, what year of school did you complete, all of that sort of data is within the database and that you're able to produce reports uh, from that. You also need to make sure that in line with the AQF qualifications register, uh, you have on your certificates a number of details and we're going to go through those soon. Students are, uh, uh, able to access their records uh, and the database must be maintained for 30 years. So we have the process here uh, that is within our policies and procedures in the QNC manual. Now, one thing that uh, we know that this, this standard is definitely going to change with the new standards that are being rewritten at the moment. So if you don't know, uh, we are currently under a VET reform and all of the standards for RTOs are being rewritten from scratch. So they're gonna to be totally different. Uh, there will be some that will be uh, still in place, but it'll be written differently. Okay, so one of the things that we identified that will change is this 30 years. It won't be a requirement for 30 years uh, due to the USI. And now we have a national register. So it will be records before the USI that you'll need to keep records of um, for that 30, well, it's not 30 years, it's indefinite now. Um, so you'll need, with USI, it's indefinite, you'll need 
all of those records for 30 years from the student completion. So you need to make sure you've got a database that is able to do that, unless you have updated the USI with all of your Vetmis data. So it could be that you have uh, contacted uh, USI and you're able to update all of your records in accordance uh, with the requirements for USI. Uh, but that means matching all of the USI numbers to the records that you have. So it depends on how long you've been operating. Okay, all right. Uh, record keeping within the database. So you need to make sure that within your database, you have name, contact details, the address, wherever they are living, uh, phone number. You'll also need to have the trainer's details. So who was the trainer? And if you have a separate assessor, you'll have to have that record on there as well. Um, you also have to include the location. So the location is in your database as well. And then the units of competencies or the training products that they completed and what were they issued with. So all of that data needs to be maintained within your database. So enough, sufficient information to be able to conduct a certificate reissue. Just gonna close my window, just hold on. School traffic. Okay, so um, this is the data again. So I've just gone through that. Uh, this is the data, but it's all of the data in order for you to be able to issue a new certificate. So if you need to do a certificate reissue, you've got all that data there. Also to verify that if someone comes to you two years, three years down the track, they're able to give you the address where they live to verify that it is actually the person whose certificate you are reissuing. Um, so all of that information needs to be in your database. Uh, records management. So the enrollment to be entered into the database. So you'll see on your enrollment form, this is our template that I've got up here. All of this abetness data must be entered into the database. So you need to have all of those uh, recorded within your database, and that is the records that you need to keep. Uh, and, and, and for full qualifications, uh, we have an assessment verification form. So I'll be going through that as well. All right. So um, I'm just going to skip out of um, the PowerPoint now, and I've just got a couple of documents that I'm going to be showing you. Okay. Uh, so uh, for uh, all of our uh, superhero members, you can access all of the documents that I'm going to be showing you on Unicorn. So that's superhero, not our sidekicks. So superhero is the consult members and sidekicks are the course members. So uh, course members don't get access to the documents, but uh, I can show you them here. Okay, so I've got a number of documents that I'm going to be going through. Any questions so far? Does that look like we've got any? Okay, all right. So the first document I'm going to be going through is the assessment verification uh, form. So this uh, assessment verification form, you can use this to verify the paper-based data with the electronic data on your database. Um, it's something that your trainer or assessor can use. It's more for longer courses, not short one day or one week courses. It's more for those longer courses where you're collecting evidence over a longer period of time. So this is a document that your trainer can use to ensure that they're collecting sufficient evidence and that this, the records from the paper-based files match with the records within the database. So the trainer should complete one of these for each student, have their name on it and the course uh, start date and finish date. Within here, uh, as an RTO, you should include all of the units that are within the qualification or, and up here, you would change the qualification type, code and title to the training product that you're delivering. So in here, you change all the units to the actual units that you're uh, you, uh, assessing. And also, you can also put place in here the different assessment tools. So if you have a number of different assessment tools for one unit, it could be a written, an observation, a group activity, you, could, you should list these all individually underneath uh, the title. And then once the student completes each unit, the trainer put places in here, the date completed and the result. 
So what should happen is a student submits their assessment. The assessment is marked by the assessor. They enter it onto the assessment verification form and then the completed assessments go back to RTO admin who then enter that into the database. And then the records are kept by RTO admin, but the trainer keeps this form until the end of the course so that they've got a record. Now you may have another system whereby they, the student or the trainer could enter the data directly into a website. So for example, Accelerate. They may use Accelerate and they're able to use, put all the records uh, within Accelerate. So you don't need to use this form. If you have a database where the trainer can access it and they can enter the details as they progress through and they're easily able to access those records to identify uh, where the student is at and where they're currently up to what they're currently up to, you can use that as well. You don't have to have this document. This is more for trainers who uh, may not have access to that sort of uh, like a database. Okay, now we're gonna have a look at a statement of attainment. So yeah. this is an example of a statement of attainment and how you should, um, uh, what should be on your statement of attainment. Now, this template is our template on Unicorn. So as I said earlier, our superhero members would be able to access these templates on their um, on Unicorn. So statement of attainment, you can see we've got all of the company details. So you should have the company name, the legal name, as well as a trading name if you're using a trading name, but it must have the legal name on the certificate. Uh, you should also have all your contact details in there, your RTO ID, uh, then you would have a student that might have a statement number that would normally come directly out of your database. First name, surname of student and a student ID. And then each unit uh, should be identified and how were they deemed, uh, were they deemed competent, RPL or credit transfer. Uh, you should uh, be able to identify each of those. Uh, on a statement of attainment, you can only use the NRT logo. You cannot use the AQF logo. The AQF logo is the Australian Qualifications Framework logo, and it's only for full qualifications. It's not for statements of attainment. Um, so you can only use the nationally recognised training logo on the statement of attainment. You should also have an authorised signatory. Uh, that authorised signatory should be uh, someone who signed a fit and proper person form on behalf of the RTO, so the CEO, or it could also be a director, or your compliance manager. So it should be someone who has completed a fit and proper person form and you've notified ASPA of that. Uh, then they need to, uh, they are able to sign that certificate. And you should also have the date that the student completed the training, as well as uh, the date issued of the certificate. Okay, so I've got, uh, that uh, first unit, that first statement of attainment that I had up. So I'll just bring that one back up again. That one. So this one is if you are just delivering one unit from a, a that is explicitly listed on your scope. So it's a unit that is explicitly listed on your scope. This statement of attainment is they're not explicitly listed it's part of a full qualification. So you have the full training product on your scope. So what's different is down here, you would have the code and title of the training product that is on your scope, where those units came from. Very important right now, if you're doing micro credentialing and you have the full training product on your scope and you are issuing short courses from that full qualification, you need to make sure that you've got this on your certificate. Also, if you have a student who's enrolled in a full qualification and they drop out and they've completed some units but not all, this is also the certificate that you would issue those students. So it forms part of a full qualification. Um, Andrew, Accelerate have a self-populating template for full quals and SOAs. Yep, so it has all of the units that are uh, uh, imported in to Accelerate. 
uh, and you just select what units and what training products you're going to have on your scope. So it's really, really good there where they're all brought in. Um, and then you may need to select uh, additional electives. So I don't know whether you know, Andrew, but the Vivacity team are going through master training at the moment with Accelerate. So we're all gonna become master trainers of Accelerate. So we're, we've just started level two uh, and we're uh, yeah learning a lot about um, Accelerate and how to use it. So thank you for that little bit of input. Okay, so that's the key difference between if you have a unit explicitly listed. So what does that mean? A unit explicitly listed is it's on your scope of registration. So when you go onto training.gov.au, it's explicitly listed as a unit that you have on your, so you've done an addition of scope for just that unit or a range of units. If you are delivering and you're allowed to, you can deliver uh, any units as a single unit or part of a short course out of a full training uh, product that you may have, so a full qualification, uh, then you would issue this certificate, which is uh, forms part of the full code and title of the training product. Okay, so now we're at the certificate. So this is your um, main certificate if you're doing full qualifications. So similar information up the top, uh, name of the student, student number, but this time we have the full training product code and title, so the uh, full qualification. You can see on this one, you can use the AQF logo. Uh, there's also text that you can use as well that I'm gonna show you soon. Um, and you can also use the NRT logo. This AQF logo must not be on any statements of attainment, no statements of attainment whatsoever. Even if it's part of a qualification, it can only go on to a full qualification. So I have picked that up a few times uh, when I've audited uh, clients where they've had the logo um, misplaced on their documents. Now, the second part with a full qualification certificate is making sure that you've got your record of results in there as well. Um, and you need to also have their first name, surname, student number, and the code and title of the full training product on the back of the certificate as well. You must also have all of these contact details on the back of the certificate um, and also an authorised signatory on both the front and the back of the certificate. So this is another one that uh, often gets picked up as well. Uh, this is just in case someone's photocopied the uh, certificate and they've only got one side. So they might only have the record of results or they only have the front of the certificate. It's got your details on there. So if they need to do a certificate issue, they know who to go to and it can also be verified. Um, and that is the reason why you need to have all of those records on both sides. Okay, so in the um, uploads that I provided you today, there is a fact sheet from ASPA, uh, which explains what I've just gone through there. So they've got a sample of what the certificates should look like. Uh, so you need to have what you need to have on those certificates. So that's in the chat. So you can download this within the chat. Um, basically what I went through. Um, any of our uh, Vivacity superhero clients, you can download those certificates and you can use them as a template. Or you could just verify it against our certificate template to make sure that you've got everything included. There are additional requirements if you are delivering training through an apprenticeship arrangement or a state funded arrangement and you need to have a look at your state funding contract to identify what additional information you may need to have on your certificates. Um, and then once again, all of those details there. So we've got a few um, in the UC, authorised person signed on the back as well um, and all of the contact details on the back as well. Um, also got information about statements of attainment. So download that from the chat. You've got that. Uh, I've also uploaded uh, this one. This is this one's actually come from the Australian Qualifications uh, Framework. So uh, this is the AQF. Um, the reason why I've uploaded both is these are different. This is ASQA and this is AQF. So they have different requirements on there. Um, the one, the best one to go by is uh, the ASQA one. Now. 
third parties. If you are delivering in partnership with another RTO, so if you're the main RTO and another RTO or training organisation is delivering under your scope of registration, you've got to be really careful when it comes to certificates. So you'll see down the bottom here, um, so a non-RTO third party cannot offer to provide or provide a VET course under its own name and without written agreement with an RTO that has the VET course on scope. This is a third party uh, cannot advertise, uh, offer to provide or provide a VET course in its own name or issue qualifications or statements of attainment in its own name or with its logo included. So you need to make sure um, with your non-RTOs, if there are non-RTO, uh, they cannot have their logo on it. Now, if you are uh, an RTO in a third party arrangement, you need to make sure that both RTOs have the same product on their training product on their scope and you can use a logo with another RTO. So they can put their logo on it, but the issuing or RTO needs to have all of their details in there. So their legal details. Okay, any questions around the certificates? Nope, nothing at the moment. Okay, oh, hold on. Someone's put one in the Q and A. Uh, as for statement of attainment, one only says you have to have date of issue. Do you need to have date completed and date um, of issue? Okay, let's get to. You. So that's statement of attainment uh, that has just one date on there. I don't know whether. see if this one because this is the one you need to have a look at um see this one hasn't even got oh no it's got identity issuing organization steel um it hasn't it's just got a date on it it's not really clear on that one i have actually read it where it actually says you need to have both dates on there so it's when they completed the training and when you issued the certificate now if you're doing it in a very short period that should be fine. You should be uh, fine with doing that. But there should be a uh, mechanism within your um, database to be able to uh, to put the date of issue and the date the student uh, completed their assessments. So it's when they are marked competent, um, as competent, okay? I'm hoping I answered that. Now, in the Unicorn documents, you'll find this certificate reissue form. We highly recommend that you use this certificate reissue form. If someone comes to you uh, at a later date and they want to have a certificate reissue, uh, they complete this form. So you can uh, get all of their details on the form. What's the training product? Um, you need to get certified copies of photo ID to make sure that it is the actual person who um, is entered in your database. Um, you can also take your payment on the form. You can also convert this form to an online link. So you could have an online form that the uh, candidate could complete as well and pay for online. So it's up to you how you want to do it. Now, a certificate reissue with ASPA, so, or sorry, not ASPA, USI, if a student was to go to USI to get a certificate reissue, uh, they would be paying a minimum of $80 for a statement of attainment and $150 for a full training uh, product. So um, you should charge the same. The thing that's good about getting a certificate from you is you've got your logo and all your information on it uh, compared to if they go to USI, it has some very basic information on there. Um, and it has the government's logo on there, not your logo. So, um, uh, so you can charge more if you wanted to. Um, we just recommend charge around the same as what ASC, uh, USI would charge for a certificate reissue. Okay, so that's certificate reissue. Get back to the PowerPoint. Um, while I'm doing this, you can pop any questions you may have in the chat. 
Okay. All right. So that was USI. I've just gone through and uh, the process for assessment verification form. So as I stated earlier, superhero uh, members, you can access this form on Unicorn. Uh, but this is a really good way to make sure that your paper-based files actually meet, match your database files. Uh, so it's a good way to be able to do that if your trainer assessor doesn't have access to the database or some sort of other mechanism for recording results on an ongoing basis. Uh, this is taken from the policies and procedures within the QNC manual, so uh, check that out. Prior to distribution of the certificate, in order to ensure that the student is issued with the correct certificate, it is the CEO's responsibility to check that uh, all of the units are correct, uh, that the statement of attainment includes the units that the student did complete, uh, all the contact details of the student is uh, correct, including spelling and the legal name. So you need to make sure that the legal name of the student is on the certificate. So that's why you need to sign. You don't need to take a photocopy or a copy or anything of the license or some photo ID, but you should actually uh, cite it. So cite it so that you know that the spelling is correct. Um, you can also take a photocopy or a, uh, take a photo from the phone, which is what trainers can do um, when they're in the training uh, and keep that on the record. That's, that's not a problem but it's making sure that the student details are correct. A certificate should only be issued in the legal name of the student, not any other name. So you should be verifying that you actually have the legal name. Now this makes it much easier when they have a USI because you can verify it on USI. So that's why it's really important that you are verifying on USI. Uh, so you're looking at the records that you've received on the enrollment form and that they are matched up with the USI. Um, it's also ensuring that the code and title of the training products are correct on the documents. Um, I have uh, experienced myself and I've also seen it when I've gone to audit where certificates have been issued incorrectly. Um, one example is I had uh, one of my team members actually who did a, a traineeship through us uh, no, they did a traineeship through another company before they came to us and they were issued with a certificate in, it was called uh, business administration, so a certificate for in business administration, when they actually completed a certificate for in business. And they had the right code, but the wrong title. So you need to make sure that you're checking that. Now, if you're using a database such as Accelerate, I know WiseNet do it, um, vet track do it as well. All of the data has been brought in from TGA, so it should be all correct, but make sure that you're issuing the correct certificate for the student who's completed. Okay, tips for ensuring the integrity of certification. Uh, ASCO will focus on evidence demonstrating the integrity and credibility of qualifications issued. Uh, so this might mean uh, testing that your systems and risk controls are robust. ASQA may look at whether your issuance practice aligns with your documented system. So it's looking at, this is what your policy and procedure says that you do. Are you actually putting it into practice? Do you do what your policies and procedures uh, state? Now, this is where it's really important following the compliance webinar that you go back to the policies and procedures and make sure that you're actually doing what's in the policies and procedures. If you've modified your process, you need to update your policies and procedures and make sure that that is compliant with what you're actually doing. So make sure that you're reviewing that as part of your process following attendance to this webinar. Uh, ASQA's previous regulatory experience has found examples of non-compliances with these requirements uh, to ensure the integrity of the qualifications. Uh, some of it is inadequate uh, verification of identity of the student who is enrolling into the training. Uh, we've also seen uh, that trainers and assessors qualifications haven't been verified either. So that's where it's really important to make sure that you're verifying and that you know that the person that you're issuing the certificate to or you're doing a credit transfer or an RPO, you've actually got all of their legal details and it is the uh, correct person. Um, they've also noted using outdated course nomenclature. 
uh, or outdated information such as superseded units of competency. So they've got the wrong uh, units uh, that they're issuing certificates. Now, ASQA can go back and actually look on TGA when you had training products on your scope and when you've issued the certificate. So if you've issued a certificate when the training product was not on your scope, uh, then you've broken the requirements of the legislation. Uh, not clearly identifying the RTO, so the certificates are not clear of who they are uh, and haven't got the RTO ID. So uh, make sure you've got the RTO ID on there. Uh, inaccurate or incomplete register, so the database hasn't been kept up to date and all of the data has not been entered. So that's where it's really important to make sure that you've got someone who's managing your database and keeping those records up to date. Not providing information about the language of instruction, so it could be how you have delivered the training. Uh, in, um, in, you can deliver training in Australia in a different language, but it needs to be clear on the certificate what language was the student assessed in. So that's the most important part. So uh, this is mainly for international students where you might bring international students into Australia and you deliver a training product in another language. Uh, it can also be if you're delivering overseas. So you may be delivering overseas and you're delivering in a different language. So that's, um, you've just got to make sure it's clear on the certificate what language was, if it's delivered in English, you don't need to worry about it. If it's any other language, then it needs to be identified on the certificate. Okay, so I think we've gone through all of those, I've gone through the certificates. Uh, logos, I did talk about this a little bit, so making sure you've got the correct logos on your certificates. If you are issuing non-accredited training, you cannot use either of these logos on your non-accredited training. You can still have all of your contact details, your RTO ID, um, all of that information can go on there. You just cannot use these logos and you cannot say it's a certificate in or a diploma in. It's just a statement of attendance or accredited, non-accredited course um, that you're issuing a certificate for. But you, by all means, you can issue a certificate. Uh, we used to, when I had my RTO, we used to deliver non-accredited training for our trainers and assessors on um, PD for trainers and assessors. And we used to issue uh, accredited, non-accredited certificates. Uh, that was a statement of attendance uh, for that training. Uh, but yes, as an RTO, you can't put, you can put your logo on, but you can't put the NRT or the AQF logo on there. Okay. Um, all right, so certificate reissues, we've gone through a bit of that. So all reissuance of certificate documentation will be based on the verification. So making sure that you're verifying um, and then making sure that the database is up to date with all of the information on that certificate. I showed you the certificate reissue form. So we had a look at that one. Okay, so that's it for the standards for RTOs. We're now gonna have a look at CRICOS. So are there any questions before I move on to those ones? Is there any do's or don'ts for using the NRT and AQF logos, colors, size, black and white? Yes, there definitely is. Uh, so with when it comes to the AQF logo and the NRT logo, you can only do it in grayscale, print in grayscale or color. So you can use the color uh, logos and it has to be the actual logos uh, that uh, are issued, the AQF logo and the NRT logo. Now these ones are stretched uh, and that's because the PowerPoint's been stretched out, uh, but you, you've got to be careful. You can't resize, you can't stretch it, you can't uh, change the image aspects of it at all. Uh, I've actually been to audits where I've seen the uh, NRT and AQF logo. I'll just go back to this one. Uh, printed in a different colour. So one organisation, they decided that they were going to have their certificates and the AQF logo and the NRT logo printed in their corporate colours on the certificate. That's a non-compliance. You can't do that. You can only do grayscale or the colours that are stipulated um, within the logos. Now, I did put the NRT logo specifications uh, up on in the chat. So you've got that one in there that actually tells you the colors 
uh, the actual colours uh, that you are to use on the certificates. So you need to make sure that you're using those. Um, I've also got, um, I've also got a fact sheet about the AQF. Here we go. So I've just uploaded the AQF as well. Uh, not a fact sheet, this is the AQF guide. So that has information in there about the logo and the colours that you use as well. So uh, you can use grayscale, black and white, um, size, you need to have a minimum of one centimetre around the outside of the logo. So the space around the logo needs to be um, at least one centimetre around the outside of the logo. So you, you shouldn't have any text that is close to this. There should be a minimum of one centimetre on your certificates. Now you can have the logo can be any size you want. There's no restrictions on size but there needs to be a one centimetre buffer uh, with the logo on your certificate. So that making sure that they're, um, it's easily identifiable. So thank you for that question or questions, Andrew. That was really, really good. Uh, when you issue non-accredited training, this is from Kerry, uh, awareness course, can it have the unit code name and title on it? So you're delivering a non-accredited course that is what a refresher I'm assuming Kerry do you want to pop that in the chat is it a refresher that you're doing because if it's a refresher or so awareness course can you explain an awareness course not a refresher so an awareness course is that like a information session or induction or um if you're delivering the full unit and you're doing conducting an assessment, then it's a statement of attainment and you're putting the code and title of the training product. If it's a non-accredited course, you can't use the code and title. So I know that straight up. You can call it something else. So it does not give you a SOA or a license yet. So you call it something else. You call it an awareness course and it's a non-accredited. So statement of attendance and whatever you call the course, that would be um, what you would put on there. I hope that makes sense. Code and title should only be used for a, a statement of attainment or a full training product. So a um, one that would also have the NIT or the Q, uh, AQF logo. Does that answer your question? I'm assuming. Uh, it is a non-accredited course. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Excellent. Any other questions while we're um, going through these? And then I'm going to go, we're going to have a look at uh, CRICOS standards. So I don't know how many we've got left on here. Let's see. Okay. All right. Um, don't, uh, don't worry about me moving ahead. If you've still got a question, just pop it in the chat. So not a problem there at all. Okay, all right, standards 9.1 to 9.2. So this is where a registered provider must have and implement a documented process for assessing and approving and recording deferment of the commencement of study or suspension of study. So this is international students. Um, and you need to have a whole process for your deferring and suspending. So uh, within the standards, it's making sure that you only suspend or cancel a student's enrollment due to a number of factors. So mis mis misbehavior by the student, uh, they didn't pay their fees, uh, they've breached the course progress requirements. So it could be attendance or academic uh, progress uh, for the student. And that would be a reason why you would suspend or cancel a student. Um, if the registered provider initiates a suspension or cancellation, you need to make sure that you've got systems and processes in place to ensure that the student is well aware of their rights and responsibilities as a student and also the process for submitting a complaint or appealing your decision. So you need to inform them in writing that they have that right. Uh, when there is any deferral, su suspension or cancellation action uh, must be taken under the standards um, and the student has the right to be able to seek advice and feedback um, and also uh, the change of enrolment under the ESOS Act. 
So standard 9.6, the suspension or cancellation of the overseas students' enrolment under standard 9.3 cannot take effect until all of the internal process has been managed first. Uh, that includes the complaints and appeals process. Um, we have within the policies and procedures for um, CRICOS providers, uh, all of the records and decision-making, what you need to make sure that you're aware of. Uh, we also have a range of documents that you can use for intent to cancel or intend to uh, suspend. So there is a whole process there for the documentation. Uh, recently, we delivered a whole webinar on the CRICOS standards. So if you're new and you haven't attended that yet, that is all recorded and it's up on Vivacity Training so you can access that. Deferment of commencement of study. So you, you can grant a deferment of commencement study under compassionate and compelling circumstances um, of which there are a number there. A request for deferment, uh, they should be completing a form and you should have it all in writing with, for the students. So a change of enrollment application form, uh, or if they're going to defer, there are a range of forms for our superhero clients. They're already on Unicorn and you can access those there but you need to make sure the whole process is in writing. Um, once a student has commenced the course, the Institute will only grant a suspension of a student study under compassionate and compelling reasons. So we've already gone through some of those. Uh, effect of, so uh, this will affect the COE. So registered providers must tell overseas students that de deferring, suspending or cancelling their enrollment on any grounds may affect their student visa. There are three possible outcomes with, when it comes to deferral, ref, um, uh, suspension or cancellation. Uh, you need to notify DHA through PRISMS uh, that the student is deferring or suspending and what the period will be and how that uh, is going to affect the end date of the COE. Uh, that they are deferring or suspending an overseas student enrollment for a period which can affect the end of the COE as well. Uh, that it wishes to permanently cancel or terminate the overseas student's enrolment. Regardless of the reason, if their overseas student enrolment is deferred or suspended, the period of suspension of enrolment needs to be entered in prisons and included in your attendance monitoring cal uh, calculations. Um, if the student initiates the deferral, suspension or cancellation, it is up to the a registered provider to be able to defer and suspend the enrolment of the overseas student if there are compelling uh, reasons. Um, and then it's just making sure that you have that whole process in place of, you know, if they're deferring, when are they going to restart? Have you got it all in writing? Everyone signed off for it. Uh, this is to protect you and the student. Uh, we, we've gone, I've got a lot of repetitive slides, so <laughs> uh, provider initiated. So if you've initiated the suspension or cancellation, um, you need to make sure that you have a clear process that is complaints and appeals and that the student has the right to appeal the result. Um, if it's a misbehaviour of the student, if they've broken the uh, requirements of your policies and procedures, that can be a reason why you may suspend or cancel. Uh, the student hasn't paid you um, or they've breached their attendance requirements. Uh, the overseas student must be given a notice of intention to report and 20 working days to access the registered provider's internal complaints and appeals process. So this is a requirement to protect the student to make sure that they have the right uh, to be able to respond. Uh, in cases of misbehaviour or non-behaviour uh, payment, uh, you may proceed with deferral, suspension or cancellation after the complaints procedure. The overseas student does not have to be given the opportunity to appeal a provider initiated deferral, suspension or cancellation of enrolment when the overseas student's health or well-being or the well-being of others is likely to be at risk. So if they're um, putting other students at risk, uh, you do not need to go through that 30-day process. Uh, you can suspend them straight away. So this may include, but not limited to, refuses to maintain approved care arrangements if they are under eight, the age of 18, if they've gone missing, um, has medical concerns, severe depression or psychological issues, which lead the provider to fear the overseas student's well-being, 
has engaged or threatens to engage in behaviour that is reasonably believed to endanger the overseas student or is at risk of committing a criminal offence. So these are reasons why you can defer or cancel straight away and you don't need to go through the complaints process. Um, we have within the QNC manual a whole change of uh, enrolment process, which includes all of the documentation. Um, if you are working with international students, make sure that you go through that policy and procedure and that process uh, that is in there and um, make sure you're updating it if it's a different process. With this is all uh, ASQA audit uh, approved, it's all got through ASQA audit, it's never been a problem. So I'd recommend that you use ours. Uh, ESOS Act requirements. So it is uh, under the ESOS Act, refunds owned owed to the defaulting student to be paid within four weeks of the default date. Uh, the student default must be reported through PRISMS uh, within seven days of the provider obligation period ending. So provider obligation period is four weeks uh, from the default date. Okay, and that's it for now. Um, when it comes to the VET reform update, uh, I did talk about it this morning in the mastermind. Um, which we do every week at 10.30 a.m. every Monday. Uh, we talked about the new TGA survey. So there's a training.gov.au survey that's out. Uh, we've placed it on the Facebook group. So you can go to the members Facebook group and you can see the link in there. Uh, TGA are wanting feedback from people who use TGA because they're doing a um, full overhaul and they wanna know what type of data are you using on TGA. So I recommend that you get onto TGA uh, and complete that survey. And as I said, we've put it in the members chat. Okay, that's it for today. The next webinar is on the 6th of September and we will be going through conducting effective assessments. If you're a trainer or assessor, and we're only doing that, we're not doing any cry costs because it's a biggie. Um, we're going to be going through what is the evidence requirements, what is sufficient evidence, making sure that you are meeting the rules of evidence and principles assessment. So I'll be answering questions about that as well. So I highly recommend that you get on to the next webinar on the 6th of September, where we'll just be going through uh, the effective assessment process. So thank you very much for attending today. Uh, please remember that this uh, has been recorded. So if you would like to re-watch it, you can. Um, if you think you may have missed some information, you can go to vivacity.training and you'll be able to access the training. It should be up within um, 24 hours. You'll be able to access uh, this video up on Vivacity Training. Thank you very much for attending today. If you don't have any further questions, that's it for today, right on time. Um, I look forward to catching up with you at the Mastermind, which is on Monday at 10.30 a.m. And just a reminder that our next Eight Critical Drivers Masterclass, we're going to be covering industry consultation, networking, and what is the most effective way to do that, particularly for right now and what we're, uh, where we're at right now. So thank you for attending, and I look forward to catching up with you again soon.